this one. Uh, no, I think everyone's great line of point. Okay, we don't have time to do some on this. Cool. All right. Hi, everybody. You'll notice that you are muted. I'm sorry, uh, but only for now. Um, we're not worried about Nazis this time, so that's kind of exciting. I'm pretty sure I know who all of you are and that you're not Nazis. So that's exciting. Uh, and welcome to the first of three parts of stuff you didn't learn in Hebrew school. So whether you went to Hebrew school, I can pretty much guarantee you never learned this or, or Jewish day school or whatever. I never went to Jewish day school, so I can't talk about what they learned there, but I'm pretty sure they didn't learn the stuff I'm teaching. And if you never went to Hebrew school or Jewish day school or didn't grow up Jewish, then you almost certainly didn't learn any of this stuff. And uh, it's stuff that, well, Jennifer Rosenzweig was like, okay, it's time for you to teach something. It's really time you need to really learn. You, you gotta teach something. People want you to teach something. And I was like, well, keep pushing me. I'm gonna teach whatever the heck I find interesting. And so that's how this idea was born. I was like, well, if I have to teach something, uh, and I do like to teach, I'm gonna teach whatever the heck I want. So I'm teaching things that I only learned about as an adult. And I think it's a pity when your Jewish education ends, once you're like, I mean, we, this is all our lecture. We don't really teach Judaism past like a kindergarten level. We teach like baby theology to adults and we expect them to be okay with it. But it's a whole other soapbox. But this is stuff I only learned like as an adult, which is just such a uh, unfortunate thing. So this first class is going to be on demons because I don't know about you, but growing up, I always learned like Judaism is a very rational religion. Like we believe in God and pretty much nothing else. Maybe like angels or something. I don't know, but definitely none of that, you know, superstitious stuff. Which like, okay, but then I got older and I learned the Talmud and I learned some other stuff and I was like, oh no, not only do we have demonology in our tradition, but we like, it's very involved and very detailed and there is a lot of it and i'm not going to sit here for the next you know like was that for 52 minutes and tell you this is why you need to believe there are demons that's not the point of this at all the point of this is to show you that our jewish tradition is full of so much stuff and it's so rich and it's so varied and i think you're missing out if you didn't learn all this cool weird stuff that i learned and i think it's interesting um I will stop and ask for questions and I can see the participants on the side. So if you have a, I'll stop me like, are there any questions? And if I see you have like a hand raised or if I see you waving your arm around on the two screens right now, so it's a little bit confusing, I'll call on you or just like unmute yourself and then be like, Sarah, Rabbi Fort, whatever, I respond to both. Uh, question, and then I will, you know, do my best to answer it. Um, any questions before we begin learning all about demons, Jewish demons specifically? Was anyone ever told, like when they were kids growing up, like Jews don't believe in that superstitious stuff? I see some nodding. So, okay, well, I know, for the people who aren't nodding, I know why you're not nodding. <laughs> but I think a lot of people kind of grow up with this. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Hi, Rabbi. Yes. Just one question. Not the golem, right? Sorry, I'm just like turning on my sound. Say, say it again like the golem or is that a different kind of demon no not it's it's not not like the golem yeah there is that idea and like in the um, comes from over in like yiddishy kind of like the eastern european kind of jewish lore the the golems and the dibex kind of kind of relate to that i'm actually going to go even older than that but yes it is in that vein but older we're going to go like we're going to go throw back ancient judaism the people who we thought were just like so rational and they were but not all the time but you're, you're not you're not you're not you're not wrong okay so, thank you yo all right i'm going to share my screen so you can see all my lovely sources sorry, sorry. we'll get through what we get through okay so hopefully you can still see hopefully you can see the screen no i can so Stuff you definitely never learn in Hebrew school. Demons. First question, how did demons come to be? Who, who created them? Where did demons come from? That's a very good basic question. Um, well, fun fact, Pirkei Avot 
uh, Samantha's Pirkei Avot is around the time of the Mishnah, so it was compiled around the year 200. Um, it predates, like the ideas behind it are older, they were just kind of like all put together and compiled and redacted around the year 200, just to give you an idea of time-wise. Asra Devarim Mira'u Be'erev Shabbat, 10 things were created on the eve of the first Shabbat of at twilight. And these are these 10 things. And then it goes on to list 10 things, one of which is the Shamir, which is the worm that helped build the temple. We're going to get into that. Remember the worm. Bookmark the worm. In your mind, the worm comes back. We're going to move on from the worm. And what else was created in this in-between time? The Bein Hashemashel, by the way, is a time between like candle lighting and nightfall. So it's like Shabbat started but it's not really dark yet. It's this weird twilight in between time. It's also very magical and mystical. And all these crazy things were created. And then the rabbis say that the cave of Machpelah was created then, that the ram that Abraham sacrificed instead of Isaac was created, and all sorts of like normal things that were also mystical things. And Yeshomrim, our rabbis do this a lot, and I love it. They say, like, well, this isn't the main opinion, but it's Another opinion, we are big on minority opinions. We include all the opinions when it comes to Judaism. We love all opinions. But Yeshomrim, some people say that something else that was created in the Benash Mashal period, the weird intermediary period of between when Shabbat starts and when like, it actually starts, Ah, Mazikim. Well, some say that the Mazikim were created on the eve of Shabbat, of the first Shabbat that God created. So we learn from this that the rabbis believe that one, Mazikim, which are demons, were created by God. And two, they were created in this weird quasi-Shabbat time. And with all these other things that were generally thought of as being good things, Mazikin were created. So our ancient rabbis believed that Mazikin, first of all, were a thing, and that God created them. So that's a very interesting idea, I would say. We're gonna get through like a first, these first couple things, and then we're gonna like take questions and thoughts. Okay. So, how many demons are there? How many demons could there possibly be? Well, Tanya, it was taught, we're reading this now in Brachot uh, 6a, so we're now in the Gemara, the Talmud, so it was compiled around the year 500, it's the kind of like new and improved version on top of the Mishnah. Abba Binyamin says that if the eye was given permission to see, meaning you normally can't see it, but if suddenly somehow you could see, no creature could withstand the abundance and the ubiquity of demons and live unaffected. Now the bold, you'll notice some of it is bold, some of it is not bold. The bold is the actual direct translation of the text. The not bold is the kind of explanations by uh, Rabbi Adin Steinseltz. And when he writes, he puts in these little, he kind of fills in the gaps. So you should know, I think it's important when you're learning a text. A lot of times when people teach text, they kind of just teach you the whole thing. But I think it's important for you to know what's in actually the translation and what's the stuff that's given in there because I think it's important for you to know, big on accuracy. So, Abba Minyamin says there are, if you knew how many demons there were, he says, you wouldn't be able to function. And Abaye says they are more numerous than we, and they stand over us like mounds of earth surrounding a pit. Okay, so not only are there demons, but there are so many demons. How many demons that if you knew how many demons there were, you wouldn't be able to function? And Ravuna says, each and every one of us has a thousand demons to their left and a thousand to their right. And he backs this up his proof text. It comes from Psalms. It has nothing at all to do with demons, but this is what he uses as a proof text. So how many demons exist? Thousands, according to the ancient rabbis. Thousands. And we have a thousand demons on our left and a thousand demons on our right. And if we could see them, if we could grasp the enormity of how many demons exist, we wouldn't be able to do anything. But what if, and you might say this, what if they're metaphorical demons? What if, you know, we, we all walk through life with the demons, you know, weighing on us. We have the demons of self-doubt and self-pity and arrogance and, and, and uh, laziness and critique. We have so many demons weighing on us, right? Like, what if the rabbis are talking in metaphors? Well, what do demons do? This is all in a line, by the way, when you learn this in the Talmud. These pieces come one, I'm not cherry picking, it literally comes one after the other, after the other, after the other. So after explaining about how many demons exist in the world, the rabbi then give us a list of things, problems that demons cause. Rava said, 
these are some things like demon, issues of demons cause crowding at a kalal. When you're at a gathering and it's too dang many people, it's demons. When your knees are fatigued and you haven't done anything, it's demons, not age, demons, not the arthritis. If your clothes wear out, demons. It's from the friction with demons. And when your feet hurt, it's demons. So I think it's very clear that the ancient rabbis didn't think of these as like metaphorical demons, like we're all wrestling with our own demons. No, like they literally believed in literal demons. I love it. I love it. I think Judaism obviously is a very rational religion, but like also we've got like all sorts of stuff going on. Um, questions, comments about the very literal demons that our ancient and wise rabbis uh, believed in. Can I, see, I can see like four of you at a time. So you might just have to unmute yourself and be like, hey. Questions, Why? Comments? Why what? Why did uh, Hashem create demons to begin with? What? Well, oh man. Hold on to that question. And if by the end you don't have some inkling of an answer, we'll keep talking. It's a good question. Hold on to it. Demons are real. Sarah, yes? Um, is it sort of like gremlins? Oh, we always say, oh, the, the gremlins cause that. So instead, oh, it's like when you're, you know, the dryer takes one of your socks kind of a thing. Gremlins, yeah. So well, demons, interchangeable? Uh, I would say yes, but like there are the Talmuds, when the Torah, if you wanted to tease out stuff from Torah, I mean, the Torah is talking about demons. Like you could tease it out, but it's very vague. The, the Talmud has, I think, a very complex demonology. We're going to get like there's there's so many, there's levels, there's types, there's, there's some that are very like imps, you know, the ones that steal your socks and everything, the ones that, you know, make your clothes wear out. And then there's like demons that cause you sickness, demons that can hurt you physically. And there's like, there's rankings of demons. And okay. so yes, and I think, very good question. Any other thoughts on demons and their abilities? Cool. So now we know that demons to the ancient rabbis are a literal thing. They are real. Wouldn't you like to know if you have a demon infestation in your house? It's a practical question. The rabbis have a solution for that. God bless them. Again, this is in the same line of text. If you're studying this Gemara, if you're learning the Zafo Gemara, you can see we're still in Brachot 6a. Okay. One who seeks to know that there are demons, in, not that they exist, period, but they exist in your home, you need to place fine ashes around the bed. And in the morning, the demon's footprints would appear, like chicken's footprints, in the ashes. Ugh, my husband wants to burn. Ugh, fine. So there, wondering if you have a demon problem in your, in your home? Put some ashes around your bed. Now, where, notice, what's the place, the location of the house that they are concerned about you having a demon problem? It's in the bed. Bookmark that in your mind, like the Shamir, we're going to come back to it. One who seeks to see demons, remember, because you can't see demons, we've already established that you cannot see them. But if you wanted to see demons, you should take, this is getting to get gross, I'm sorry for the cat lovers, at the afterbirth of a firstborn female black cat, born to a firstborn female black cat, burn it in the fire, grind it, and place it in their eyes, and they will see them. And the faces are just like, great. Poor Dina, she looks just appalled. <laughs> and Sarah, you have a dog. And this is why. But also, like, just to pause, like, that's a good, so it has to be firstborn, which is interesting because our, our tradition, as it, most ancient traditions, like, really vaunts firstborns. Yeah, firstborns. But all of the big people of our tradition, the ones we love most in Judaism, are always, like, secondborn, second or younger, which is very interesting. Uh, female, so definitely there's something we know demonic and evil about female. Love it. And black. So dark, with the dark black, that's the rabbis, ancient people, oh, dark, we associate dark and bad. So clearly that's something we've existed for a long time. And cats, not dogs. I'm not a dog, I'm not, I'm not a cat person, so like, that's fine by me. But if you have a cat, you should know. Also, it's something, not something you could eat. So people, if you go around like burning stuff from cats, no one really cares. When the rabbis are concerned by eating it or being kosher. So that's what you do if you want to see a, a, a demon. Oh, but there is, there's a concern they have. You must place the ashes in an iron tube, iron, keep that in mind, sealed with an iron seal. And they give you the name of it. 
for whatever reason you might need, lest the demons steal it. There is a concern that the demons might want this magical ground up cat placenta back. <laughs> the way that you can see them, demons, demons want to be invisible. They don't want you to see them, according to the rabbi. You have to like read into what they're saying to really like, know what's important to them, these rabbis, in all things, not just in demons. So they know that the demons don't want you to see them. They're going to try and steal your magic cat placenta dust back. Uh, so you need to steal it up and seal the opening so that you won't be harmed. And then they give you an example. It could happen to you. And they, this happens in Gemara all the time. Rav Vevai Barabaye performed this procedure, saw the demons, and was harmed. But don't worry. The sages prayed for mercy on his behalf, and he was healed. So they warn you, and then they tell you what happens. Missed episode of Charmed. <laughs> I love Charmed. Okay, so remember the place, where, where were they worried about demons being in your house? Where was the concern area? Bedroom. The, the rabbis have lots, that's a whole, I could do a whole session on that. The rabbis have lots of pain about no. bedrooms and what happens in them. So, sorry, can't see if someone's commenting as much as they have. Maybe it was God. Okay. So, uh, what if there are demons in your bed? It's a fair question. Well, Brachot 5a, so this is a little bit before, teaches, Mara B. Yitzchak, Sarabi Yitzchak teaches, anyone who recites the Shema in their bed, it is as if they hold a double-edged sword. Not like in a bad way, like it's literally a sword with edges on both sides. You can cut with either end. Guarding against all evil, as it is stated, high praises of God in their mouth and a double-edged sword in their hands. So if you say the Shema, because you, theoretically, you say the Shema in the morning when you went to synagogue to pray with the minion, and you say the, the Shema at night when you went to synagogue to pray with the minion. But you still have to, the rabbis teach, say the Shema when you're in your bed. When you're in your bed, at the end of the night, when you're laying there, you have to say the Shema before you go to sleep. Why? Rabbi asks, why do you have to say it? Even though you've already said it twice, which is the minimum number of times you have to say it, why say it more? Ah, because if you say the Shema, when you're laying in your bed, it's as if you have a double-edged sword. Remember, and this guarding against all evil is Steinsaltz. He's reading it in because he knows what comes later and he's putting it back in, but he doesn't say that. But I gave you the Rashi, and it's on this part that is bolded. And the Rashi here, and remember, Rashi comes in the 13th century, so roughly a thousand years later, and he's explaining. When the Gemara says, it's as if you hold a double-edged sword, what is the purpose of the double-edged sword that you get? If as soon as you say your bedtime Shema, you have a sword in your bed. What is that sword for? It's to kill Mazikin, in case you have a concern about Mazikin demons. And maybe you're thinking, well, maybe he's just being crazy. Maybe, he's, they, maybe it's really just a metaphor. Nope. Nope. Rabbi Yitzchak continues to say, see, Berchot 5a, Berchot 5a, it's still Rabbi Yitzchak. Anyone who recites the Shema on their bed, demons stay away from them. It's not a metaphor. I, I think it's very clear they're not talking about metaphors. I don't think they're talking about bad dreams. I think the rabbis, very literally and calmly and rationally in their own way, we're talking about demons. They said you have to be worried about demons at night. Somebody else needs a bookmark. Uh, so are there demons in your bed? According to the rabbis, yep, there are demons that are attracted to your bed. If you sprinkle the ash around it, you can see the little chicken footprints, apparently. Uh, and if you say the Shema in bed at night, it's not just because it's a nice idea, not just because it's a great thing to say, but because it will give you a sword, a double-edged sword, with which to slay demons. And they'll stay away from you. Thoughts about um, all this crazy stuff I've unloaded on you so far. Anyone's waving their hand, I can't see it. Yes, I see a finger that's almost like waving your hand. Oh, a thumbs up. Okay, 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 okay. That's a good, that's a good one. That's a good finger to see. There are other ones that'd be less good to see. I never learned any of this in years old. Sarah, yes. Oh, sorry, I mean, unmute yourself. Hold on, I can, oh, I'll, can you do it? Yes. My grandmother always said to say the Shema, you know, last thing before you go to bed in case you died or something and die in your sleep. That the Shema is the last thing you're supposed to say before you die. Yes. Yeah, that is, that is definitely, I mean, when we do, when we rabbis help people or say for people, vidui, 
you know? Um, and theoretically, you, as someone who's dying, you should say do it for yourself, but it's not always possible. Uh, and we end it with the Shema, because the Shema is, is kind of, if it's not, it's not. There's nothing bad that's going to happen to you, but that is kind of the thing that's supposed to be like kind of on your lips as you leave this world and move on to whatever happens next, as we say the, the Shema. So it makes sense to say, of course, the Shema. I wonder if there isn't some of that like tied up in this, because also you know, the rabbis teach that sleep is one sixtieth of death. So they, they believe like when you when you sleep, a little bit, a little bit dead. Which is why when we wake up in the morning, we say prayers that are like, "Thank you, God, for bringing you back to life." But you know, you, you know, not everybody wakes up. So I think it's all kind of woven together, honestly. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Sam. Love it. Um, what did I put in next? What kind of fun demon stuff? Oh, what are demons like? Okay. This is all in the same section of Sachim 112a, but I broke it up because it's just crazy. And does anyone want to read a little bit? Because I feel like it gets really boring listening to my voice, and I think I come across very tinny. Does anyone like to read just the English? I have to read Aramaic if you don't want to. Anybody? Anybody? I sound like Fran Drescher. You can't be enjoying this. All right, you and so. Okay. Sure, I'll read. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, a sage taught, if food and drink are under one's bed, even if they are covered with iron vessels, an evil spirit rests upon them. Great, so thank you for pausing. So we're gonna see a little, you know, it, this is actually a little bit and piece of, of Kashru law. So if you have food and drink stored under your bed, as one does, uh, even if you cover them with iron, remember, what, was, what did you use to contain all of your cat placenta ashes that you used to see demons? Iron. So here we see iron pop up again. And a totally different masech a whole different, um, I don't know what English means, a whole different like chunk of the Gemara. But here it is again, iron. So even if you cover your food and drink with iron and they're covered, there's still a ruach uh, ra'ah. There's a, an evil spirit that settles on food and drink under your bed. Remember, now we're back, we have the bed. So there's that whole thing about beds and what happens in beds and the rabbis hang up on what happens in beds. Continue. The sages taught a person should not drink water on Tuesday nights or on Shabbat nights, um, Friday nights. And if one drinks water, their blood is upon their own head due to the danger. The Gemara asks, what is this danger? The Gemara answers, the, dangers, the danger of the evil spirit that rules on these days. Okay, so you're not supposed to drink water on Tuesday nights or on Friday nights. And if you do, who's like the grammar saying, whose fault is it going to be if anything bad happens? It's your own dang fault. Your blood's on your own head because of the danger, the sakana. What's the sakana? The, the grammar, you have to realize, is also kind of a conversation between like a bunch of very smart, very old dudes, and they're just talking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's easier to think of this as a conversation. And so that's why it comes out like why there's like often like a question then an answer and then a question then an answer and the refutation and then, because it's a conversation. So the Gemara, which is just kind of like you know rabbis in general, saying okay, well what is this sakana? You're saying there's a sakana. What's a sakana? You have to worry about well it's a sakana of the evil spirit. There's an evil spirit. So does it say you can't drink water? No, it says you can't drink water on Tuesday on these nights. It's something about night darkness, not being able to see. Not knowing what's out there. You hear that anxiety that the rabbis had, and it's coming out, and this they're thinking, well, mmm, demons. But not like metaphorical demons, like literal demons. But I think it's a lot of their anxiety about nighttime and being scared, which is fair, because no electricity. Okay. We have a lot of hangups about water and what's happening around the water. Do you want to keep going? Can you keep going? You just have so good. And it's just okay. kind of like me. <laughs> the sages taught a person should not drink water from rivers or from ponds at night. And if they drink, their blood is upon their own head due to the danger. The Gemara explains 
What is this danger? The danger of blindness. Blindness. Okay, so now we're getting very, I'm seeing some like shaking heads like, oh my God. This is a society that, they, they weren't dumb. I, I want to emphasize that. Our rab, ancient rabbis, they were not stupid. They also didn't have, you know, like microscopes and their understanding of anatomy was very limited. And you should read the stuff they wrote about women's body parts because they had no idea what was happening there. But, you know, they did the best they could. That, I can do a whole three part series on that, frankly. Um, they did the best they could with what they had, you know? And so if you couldn't explain it away, demons. So a person should not drink from rivers or from ponds at night, not during the day, but at night. And if you do, your blood is on your head. It's your own dang fault, they're saying, because you should know better. And there is sakana. What is a sakana? And this is, you have to like look kind of, you're gonna have to bounce between the Aramaic, which is, you know, all of this stuff, not Hebrew, it's Aramaic. If you see an olive at the end of something, like here, here, that's your clue. You're in Aramaic land. It's not, you're not in Hebrew land anymore. Uh, though there are a lot of words in common, but they're not the same. And bounce between there and here, just so you can see. So this, what is the sakana? My sakana, the Gemara asks, and then it explains, sakana shavrire, the danger of blindness. Okay, but here's the thing. What if you're walking around and it's nighttime and you're looking at a pond or you're like really thirsty, you're like really, really thirsty. What are you supposed to do? Don't worry, the rabbis have a demon-free solution for you. God bless them. They, plan, they planned this whole thing out so nicely. We're going to start saying demon incantation, Dina. Thank you so much in advance. <laughs> anyway. And if they are thirsty, what is the remedy? If there is another person with them, they should say to the other person, so-and-so, I thirst for water. Oh. And if there is no one, do I stop? Yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty much, you know, if you, that, that, that's it, that's, let's say it's, you know, solve your problem. You're thirsty, you're with another person, and you know, like, oh, if I drink from a pond, I could go blind. Oh, but then the person I say, you know what, um, I'm really thirsty for water. Boom, demon's gone. But, ah, but if there is no one, look, you're by yourself. Continue. Yep. And if there is no one else, they should say to themselves, so-and-so, my mother said to me to beware of sh Shavarire. Mm -hmm. the demon of blindness. They should continue to say the following incantation in the first part of which the demon's name gradually disappears. Shavri Ray, Ri Ray, Ri Ray, Yuri Ri. I thirst for water in white cups. This is an incantation against those demons. So the rabbis give us a problem, and then they give us a solution, to be fair to the rabbis. And you see Shavirei pop in other places, we know that it is also, this is another name for a demon that causes blindness. And so if you're by yourself, you, you mention it. It's interesting to me, like, how they placate this demon, this demon of blindness that lives in ponds and rivers at night and would want to attack you and make you blind. As you go like, you know, my mother, so that you're invoking your mother, very Jewish, you invoke your mother, you want to do Mishaber for the Cholim, we invoke your mother. Mothers offer protection, especially protection when it comes to health. My mother said to me to beware of Shabri Ray. So like, you're kind of giving the, the, the demon a little bit of kavod. You're saying like, look, you know, Shabri Ray is something that needs to be, be warned about, has a lot of power. And then you take the demon's name and you make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, kind of like lessening and lessening and lessening its power. Shabri Ray, Bi Ray Ray, Ri Ray, Yi Ri, Mi. So there's a little bit of a demon left. And you say, I thirst for water in white cups. White being light, being the opposite of dark, because the, the rabbis are connoting dark with evil and bad, and white with light and good. And that protects you against demons, specifically the demon of blindness, if you are wanting to drink water out of a river or a pond at night and you're by yourself. Thank you, Dina, for reading so much. Okay. Um, after. Uh, is anybody else any questions first of all any questions comments about this water demon that causes blindness if you drink water at the wrong time Sarah is dying right now it's just cracking me up watching her face that is a great story or a great yeah it I is. love it I love it <laughs> it is it's it's interesting and like I, I feel like especially like when I was a kid, I mean, when I was a kid, again, I only went to Hebrew school, so I really didn't learn any like Talmud or whatever, but 
even when you're learning very seriously, I feel like I'm mostly I'm learning like seriously, like here's how you keep to plot, here's how you keep kosher, which is very important, like they're great, you should learn them. But you don't learn like this kind of stuff. And to me, it just adds another dimension, another shade to our rabbis and our tradition. It doesn't mean I'm like, I definitely, I'm not, I mean, I wouldn't drink out of a river or pond because like, ew, but I, I wouldn't be worried about a demon. I'd be worried about, you know, like drinking dirty pond water. But I just, uh, I like it's interesting. I love it. I think it's awesome. But yeah, great story. There are some, there are some wild, that's a whole, I can teach a whole class of wild story in here. Rabbis had some really interesting hang ups. Uh, I forgot about next. I'm so curious. Even I'm curious what happened next. Uh, oh, okay. Where's Jason? Don't fall asleep, Jason. I know you're on your couch. Sideways. You're like, why would God possibly create demons, right? That was, that was the question. Why would God create demons? You know, like, because clearly the sword from Pirkei Avot tells us that at least Mazikin are created by God because God's creating all these crazy things in this mystical time that exists between the suns, Benash Mashop between the suns, is the literal translation of that term, of the first Shabbat, why would God create demons? What purpose could it be to create something evil? Ah. No, Sarah, you're going to like that story. You're like that story, you're going like to you're gonna love this story. In fact, Sarah, it seems like you're, you know, volunteering to read. Okay. I, I have another comment. You oh, know, when you're, say, when you're saying mazikim, that, is that the word like mazik? Where I yeah. think of... Okay, I was just... There, there are a bunch of different... In fact, we're going to see them now. There are a bunch of different... When I, I've taught about demons before, and I have a whole part, section I use um, Torah text, because the Torah text is kind of weird. Uh, and these kind of names of demons come up. They're all not, all, and not every demon is, one, is, is, a, is a mazik, is one of the mazikim. There are lots of different kinds of demons. Um, and like as we're talking about also like, you know, Dibbit or uh, not Dibbit, uh, Gollum, but there are also these ones which we're learning about in this particular um, sugya, which comes out of Gittin, which is not even like Brachot, which is full of demons and Psachim. It's a whole different section. So please hey, take us on this, this fun little trek. I got, my, I got myself Sharim and Sharot and human pleasures, Shida and Shidot. The Gemara explains Sharim and Sharot. These are types of musical instruments and human pleasures. These are pools and bathhouses. Shida and Shidot. Here in Babylonia, they interpreted these words in the following manner. Male demons, Shida, and female demons, Shiditin. In the West, Eretz Yisrael, they said, that these words are referring to carriages, she de ta. Right, so now it's a good time to kind of remind, you know, like everybody, um, that, uh, that there were two different Talmuds. One was based in um, Bavel or Babylonia, that's the Bavli, and that's kind of the Gemara. Whenever anyone like quotes Gemara, he was probably coming from that one. And those rabbis lived in uh, Babel, which is kind of like Iraq, essentially. And it's, I mean, I don't, you never think about it. I didn't think about this a little bit as in rabbinical school, because again, I pretty much grew up like your normal American secular, not, I didn't grow up secular, but I grew up like a very like assimilating, you know, like you, like I went to public school and stuff. And I just never thought about this fact, but like our, all of our Jewish thought, our Jewish ancestry, all of our traditions, everything comes out of Iraq. Like we are, we are just a Middle Eastern based people at, at, at our heart. Like we have to remember that because some of these things that everyone looks like me and these guys look like me and they definitely didn't. They looked Iraqi. So that's where one Talmud was, is from. It's from Babel. But there were two. There was one in Israel, the Yerushalmi or the Palestinian Talmud as it's called. And there are two groups of rabbis and here, they're actually pointing out, okay, well, there's two different ways that they were looking at this particular, there's this lion in Kohelet and Ecclesiastes. This Kohelet was written by, according to tradition, Solomon. And it says, I got for myself Sharim and Sharot, and human pleasures and Shidan and Shidot. And they're like, okay, well, what is Sharim and Sharot? This first thing. Those are musical instruments. And then human pleasures. Okay, well, that means pools and bathhouses because everyone likes to, you know, like, go for a shit. Sure. All right, what about Shidan and Shidot? 
well, and this is the Gemara saying, like, they knew each other, by the way. They're rabbis who traveled back and forth between Eretz Israel and Babel. The, like these rabbis who you think like were, there wasn't as isolated, like only in one space or the other. They weren't. They actually didn't know each other. And the rabbis in Babel say, well, it means demons. Male demons are shida, and female demons, shidatin, just another translation of shidot. And in the West, in Israel, in Eretz Israel, the Yerushalmi Talmud, or the Palestinian Talmud, they said that these words were referring to carriages. And they they all have to do with demons. Okay, fun fact about the Gemara. I just love teaching about Gemara, too, so now you know it. A little reminder, there were two. Okay, continue. Rabbi Yochanan says, there were 300 types of demons in a place named Shechin. Did I say that? Shechin. Mm -hmm. But I do not know what the form or nature of a demon it itself is. All right. Reminder that this is a conversation. This is a recording, essentially, of the conversation that rabbis were having. These ones in, in the Babli and Babel and the Babylonian Talmud. And so imagine that, you know, like the Gemara, they're saying, like, what are, like, well, the rabbis over there say this, and the rabbis over here say this. And then the Rabbi Yochanan's like, you know, I heard about there's these 300 demons, but I don't know anything about them. Thanks, Rabbi Yochanan, for your contribution. Weird. Okay. Oh, no. There, oh, that's a very long, okay, well. All right. Keep going. Please. Mar, Mar said, here they interpreted it. Male demons and female demons. The Gemara asks, why was it necessary for Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes, to have male demons and female demons? The Gemara answers, as it is written with regard to the building of the temple, for the house, when it was being built, was built of stone, made ready at the quarry. And there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was being built. That's from King, uh, 1 Kings 6, 7. Mm -hmm. Solomon said to the sages, how shall I make it so that the stone will be precisely cut without using iron? They said to him, there is a creature called a shamir that can cut the stones, which Moses brought and used to cut the stones of the ephod. Yeah, well, it's, that's actually not such an important part of this. But remember that shamir? Remember we're talking about things that were created in the very first the weird mystical time between when the sun starts to go down and when the, there is no sun. The very first Shabbat, all sorts of mystical things were created, like mazikim. Oh, and also a shamir. Oh, here comes a shamir again. So the Gemara is teaching, well, there are male demons and there are female demons, obviously, because how do you get more demons? You gotta have male and female demons. And, but why, and I think it touches on Jason's kind of question before, why would Solomon, who's the wise, right? Solomon was so, he's known for his wisdom. He's so wise. Why would he need male demons and female demons? Like, what could he possibly know? Well, because the temple is going to be built, they needed stones. Ah, but what is the issue with the stones for which the temple is built? Why can't they use stuff made out of iron? Anyone? Does this have something to do with the iron that we talked about before and the fact that the de you can see the demons or the alternative is, is that you can't see the demons or the, they, the demons can't get to it? I, I don't know about that specifically. I know that for this, because there is a specific ruling, like we can't make, um, the temple cannot, could not be, and any future temple, temple could not be um, created from stones that were hewn with um, things made out of metal, made out of iron, because weapons are made out of metal, made out of iron. And so the Torah itself is very specific. God is very specific. You cannot build my house out of the same thing you use to kill each other. I can't have that. My house, the temple where you pray to me, where you offer me sacrifice, where you do your prayers, cannot be made. Um, from stones hewn with metal implements that are used to make weapons. Can't happen. Okay. Well, then how do you build a temple? <laughs> well, good thing there's a shamir. Well, shamir. A shamir is a worm that, I don't know which worm it is. I don't know the current equivalent. Don't ask me which one it is. I don't know. But there was, according to Arab, 
a shamir, which is a little worm. And as it goes, there's a little oozing trail. And the ooze is like, don't laugh, so acidic, it can cut through stones. So Dina's laughing. As, as it goes all around a stone, it on its own, it leaves a little oozy trail, it's acid, it cuts the stone. And that's how we get our stones to build the temple. That's how the stones to build the temple came about, not with weapon, like, you know, metal, made axe, all the stuff they used to build, make weapons, they didn't chop, nope, nope. The Shamir and its little acidic oozing trail. And that's what they needed. They needed the Shamir. Okay, so this has something to do with the whole story. We need a Shamir to make the temple, which was Solomon's job. All right. You ready for me to read again? Oh, yes. Okay. Solomon said to them, where is it found? They said to him, bring a male demon and a female demon and torment them together. It is possible that they will know where, and due to the suffering, they will reveal the place to you. Solomon brought a male demon and a female demon and tormented them together. And they said, we do not know where to find the Shamir. Perhaps Ashmedai, king of the, ne of the demons, knows. Okay, so there's like a lot to unpack here. Uh, so they told Solomon to get a man with a female demon, he's torment both of them. Um, so Solomon, of course, died. that's just like the most logical thing to do. Uh, and they say, we don't know. Okay, we don't know, we don't know they're being tortured. However, you torment demons, I don't have to do that. Uh, we don't know where to find a Shamir, but you know who does know where the Shamir is? Ashmedai, the king of the demons. So why would God allow there to be Mazikin? I don't know. I am not the good Lord above, but perhaps they have uh, some other information that we need. Solomon certainly, according to our rabbis, did need information, and it was information that only the demons had. And also, I'd like to point out, not only are there just demons, not only are there different kinds of demons, there's a king of the demons. They have their own king. His name is Ashmedai. This sugya, it goes on at, at quite a length, and I thought about how can I like make it shorter and make it like more, we, we couldn't, it, it's, it's, it would take an hour. It, if we had the whole hour, we could dedicate to this entire sugya and it would, it would be really interesting, but we, didn't, we don't, we have like 10 minutes. So suffice it to say, they have a whole adventure together and he like gets people drunk and he sends on missions. Like he, like Ashmedai does a whole thing. Suffice it to say, it's fascinating. Um, thoughts about demons, their utilities, the fact that there's a king of the demons, Thoughts, questions, counter sermons. Jennifer looks mildly amused. Hopefully, very amused. All right, where are there demons? This might be good information. Besides, an under your bed, and besides, you know, like working around water sources, we know that's where there are demons. What other places? Are there demons? And also, more importantly, how do you protect yourself against demons? These are very related to each other. Um, I'm going to whip through this because I know everyone always wants to ask about Lilith. So I made sure we had some Lilith stuff in there. The very end. Uh, demon locations. This might be interesting to you if you have a caper bush. If you have a caper bush, um, there are demons near there. There are demons near sorb trees. There are demons found in gardens. They have a name. What's the practical difference of these definitions? Well, it makes a difference for writing an amulet. So now we know what's another way you can protect yourself against demons? Amulets. So our rabbis, they were very, you know, intelligent and righteous men who believed in God. And they also believed that sometimes you needed an amulet to protect you against the demon. So that's interesting to me. They went going to like kind of describe them as a weird little story. Um, I really want to get to the Lilith stuff. People always want to know about Lilith. The demon found near the caper bush has no eyes. Interesting. What's the point of this? Well, because if you have to run away from it, the rabbis point out that's very important. Uh, and they say one time a Torah scholar, the rabbis kind of believe that Torah scholars at once attracted demons because demons hate Torah scholars. So say the rabbis who were Torah scholars because they hate that you know so much Torah, but they're also like scared of you because you know so much Torah. Also, the rabbis kind of, you know, when it comes to Gemara, we're talking essentially to themselves and to other people with a lot of Torah knowledge. So, like, 
let that marinate. Uh, one time a Torah scholar went to go relieve himself near a caper bush. He heard the demon coming and he fled from it. Or the demon has no eyes. When this demon went, he grabbed a palm tree and it got stuck. What happened? Well, the tree dried out and the demon burst or the palm tree burst with the demon in it either way. So now the rabbis are doing this thing that the rabbis like to do in the, in the Gomara. They like to tell stories. And they're just telling demon stories of times that they or other rabbi they know encountered demons. And what happened? Cracks me up. They talk about more things about like, well, different, like this kind of tree has no less than 60 demons around it. Who cares? The rabbis ask themselves and they say, well, because if you have to write an amulet, you need to know this information. So they are practical when it comes to demons. Um, oh, and then what other, Jason asking, what's the point of having demons? Why are there demons? Well, Jason, why don't you read this one? That's what you get for asking questions. Of Psachim 110b, right? The uh, demons do oh, All right, well, I'll never ask a question again. I'll uh, teach you that question. Rava says, the one forewarning the accused of whom the sages spoke need not be a third witness, but even if the victim forewarns the murderer from his own mouth, and even if the forewarning emerged from the mouth of a demon, meaning the source of the forewarning is unknown, the forewarning is legitimate. So I know that's very confusing. It comes in a much longer discussion about witnesses and murder, and like if you have to, like, if someone tells you don't do it, and like if they see you do it, and how do we know it was a murder? That's almost less interesting to me than this particular fact is that, like, what counts as a legitimate source of warning a demon if you hear a demon warn you it counts it is a legitimate legal source of information as a legal warning it can be a person or the rabbis point out could also be a demon so they do serve a small purpose now why a demon would warn you about anything i don't know but apparently the rabbis thought the demons would warn you uh, thoughts before we go on to Lilith, because she's always everyone's like favorite lady demon. Or just favorite demon. I love Lilith. She's crazy. Everybody's had a real obsession with her. All right, last few minutes. Lilith. 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 Yeah, I'll just show you basically what we're going to You have to know some background. The first time you're going to see Lilith pop up, is in ancient Sumerians. So we're talking Mesopotamia, 30th century BCE. We have the word lil, which it means air. Follow this line through. We get early Akkadian, so it's Mesopotamia afterwards, 500 to like a thousand years later, found your map, a lot later. And now it goes from Lil meaning air to Lilit or Lilitu meaning a female night being or some kind of wind that bears disease. You can see how they got from one to the other, from Sumerian, which would be Sumer, which would be ancient Mesopotamia, to Akkadian, the language of Mesopotamia for a very, very long time. Uh, and then like later Akkadian, more modern Akkadian, which was spoken in Assyria and Babylonia, 10th century BCE. Uh, to the first century CE, so really, I mean, like, uh, more or less modern time, and you have the word, you can see the el el evolution of the language, li li or li li tu, which are spirits. You can see how this word, which is an ancient word from Mesopotamia through more uh, middle Mesopotamia through to Assyria, Babylonia, and I put those dates in there, first of all, because I think the evolution of language is fascinating, but also so you see kind of how Lilith pops up in our text, because there's nothing about Lilith in the Torah. People will say, oh, Lilith isn't it. Okay, but it's not an actual Torah. It's in Midrash, which came about ish this time, second to fifth century ish, but not, you know, not in the time the Torah was written. Lilith, Lilith isn't in there. We do see Lilith pop up in Isaiah. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit from Isaiah. Are you listening to my, I'm sure my voice is so nasal. I hate listening to my own voice. I never listen to my own sermons. Sarah. Can you do it? Can you read Isaiah for me, please? You want me to? Well, I meant Sarah Weingarten. Oh, good, good, good. No, good. 
Oh, no, I muted you. Because I thought I was unmuting you. Wait, ah, wait. Unmuting. <laughs> okay, no, read, 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 read Isaiah in five minutes. Isaiah, wild cats shall meet hyenas, goat demons shall greet each other. There too, Lilith shall repose and find herself a resting place. So is this a good time or a bad time? <laughs> Sounds like not a positive thing, right? Because like, what's happening? Well, hyenas are about to get some destruction on with the wild cats. There are goat demons. Sounds like a party. Sounds like a super, it sounds like an evil party. It sounds like a party <laughs> of evil. So clearly it's like a, a festivity of evilness. The, you know, these kind of carnivorous cats and hyenas, which were, you know, had a bad rap in The Lion King and in ancient times. Goat demons are out there greeting each other. So they're definitely having a party. And Lilith, Lilith, will be just like kicking back and relaxing. So says Isaiah. So it's not Torah text, so it's a lot later than Torah, but she she's in there. And keeping an, an eye on like that timing and this timing. You can see how that term gets in there. So that's Isaiah. Now let's let's pop up to Eruvin. Um, yeah, Siri so did such a good job. He, re, re, read some Gamara for us. Adam, oh, what, he, what Adam was up to? He had some time on his hands. What was Adam doing? Apparently, mm -hmm. uh, Rabbi Yermea ben Elzar said, all those years during which Adam was ostracized for the sin of involving the tree of knowledge, he fathered spirits, demons, and female demons, as it is stated. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, by infer inference, until now, the age of 130, he did not bear after his image, but rather bore other creatures. Okay. <laughs> well, the rabbis say that, you know, we all know that Adam had, you know, like the first two sons, and then he had another son, and then he lived a very, very long time. What was he doing in all that time? Well, the rabbis say, well, he had a bunch of spirits and demons male and female were his children. And who was the mother of all of these demon children? Well, the rabbis attribute that to Lilith. Wow. That's, that was, that's where it comes from. Party with the bad girl. <laughs> yeah, you know, it takes all kinds, it takes all kinds. And the <laughs> last little bit is this part from Iruvin. What is, these are bad qualities. They're qualities that they attribute to being, you know, what is like a woman who's like Lilith, who's like Lilith. What, what do we know about these bad women who are like Lilith? Do you want me to read it instead of you? I can read it. Sure, I can read it. Uh, yeah. It was taught in a... Uh, Baraita. Baraita, that's a new word. She grows her hair long like Lilith. A demon, she sits and urinates like an animal and serves as a pillow for her husband during sexual relations. So these are a list of things that the rabbis clearly are not huge fans of because they're associated with Lilith, Lilith, and they say, well, what do we say about these bad women, these cursed women? Well, they grow their hair long like Lilith, Lilith. They sit when they pee, like, I don't know, done all of it, pretty much, and they serve as a pillow for their husbands during sexual which is I don't know what that means and I don't know why it's a bad thing but apparently it's something and it's a bad thing and they had feelings about it <laughs> the face that I'm seeing right now and like the gallery viewer just like cracking me up <laughs> so this is like I had to like do like a, a smattering of like stuff in Lilith because Lilith stuff is extensive and so I had to like just give you like little tidbits from it because there's just there's so much cool stuff in there that could be its own thing though for sure uh so big adult big picture judaism is definitely a rational religion and i'm not sitting here saying you need to believe there are demons who are gonna like get into your fingernails they, they thought demons were in your fingernail clipping and you don't have, like there you need to believe that there are demons that if you have a cup of water out longer than three hours then there will be demons in it. that's literally things i'm not saying you need to think that i don't think that what I am saying is that our Jewish tradition is rich with all sorts of fun stuff and all sorts of stories that I didn't learn how I was growing up and I definitely did not learn this in Hebrew school. 
And I don't think it would have turned me off of religion or this religion, of course, but I just love the, the shades and the nuance it adds. And it also, if nothing else, even if you don't take this as like, there's literally demons, it shows a lot about the rabbi's anxieties and like the things that they were worried about and the things that they were, they had the anxieties that they had and how did they explain things that they could not explain. And what did they think about the natural world and what did they think about women and what did they think about um, uh, like Torah scholars, like Jews who were Torah scholars versus the you know, Roman Middle Joe Schmo, you know, Cohen, that kind of a thing. Um, and I think it's really interesting. I didn't learn about it until I was an adult and I'm glad that Hopefully, I've hopefully you've learned something new, and I want to be really mindful of the time because I like to be ending on time. Um, next week in class, we will talk about something I did not learn until I was an adult, which is all the different genders that the Talmud likes to talk about because the Talmud and also the Torah don't really do the gender binary, even though I don't think I ever learned about that until I was. I, I thought that until I was adult, and then I learned about what the Talmud says in the Torah, and I was like, oh, this is cool. So I hope you'll join me then. you have any thank questions? You, please, oh, thank, thank you. you. Any questions or comments, feel free to email me or text or Facebook message or whatever. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stick around and ask me if you need to go. I want to be mindful of the time that it goes. It is 9 o'clock at night, but this is just easier for me time because I have a baby. See you next week. See ya. Sarah, I'm still yes. confused. Can you Don't explain mind. why there are demons? Because I'm not a smart rabbinic scholar. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't think you have to believe there are literally demons. I think that the rabbis who believed in literal demons, I, I really think it's very obvious, believe that, you know, there are lots of things that God created that hurt people, that have the capacity to hurt people. Like, why did God, it's the same thing as saying, like, why did God create the body that only lives, you know, a certain number of years and then dies? Why did God create, did God, did God have to create fire that also can burn us to death? Did God have to create water that we could drown in? Like, there was just the nature of the world. And for the rabbis, and it also meant that there were demons. And like, what's the nature of the world? There's demons in them. And sometimes they can be helpful. And sometimes they can know things that are important and sometimes like they can hurt us. We have to learn how to protect ourselves from them. But like the thing we have to protect, protect ourselves from fire, protect ourselves from drowning, we also have to protect ourselves from demons. I said that as someone who does not think that there are demons, but if I had to make my guess as a religious Jew, that's what my guess would be. I'm not that smart. You're plenty smart, Jason. Don't be a false in my opinion. Very, very, very interesting. It's like, like these are good, like, um, these are stories that you would say, like, at slumber parties or, like, around campfires. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. It's, it's definitely, definitely, like, <laughs> imagine the rabbis do, like, talking about this kind of stuff. Because, like, again, the, the Gemara really is a good conversation between these very wise, superstitious, but very wise men, and they... We're just talking about all the different things that they, because like, that's what they're saying, like, oh, but I heard about this one guy, and he was peeing in a bush, and then the demon attacked him, or this guy, you know, like, he made the powder, and he put it in his eyes, and he could see demons, and then the demons attacked him, like, it's, you should see those things they talk about when they talk about uh, visiting houses of ill repute, because they have stories, and they trade stories. <laughs> I'm not teaching that class, sorry. <laughs> Maybe, maybe second version. But yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for coming. I'm happy to answer any other questions. If you want to go, you can go. I stop being entertaining. See you next week. Multiple thanks. genders. Bye bye. I'm so excited. Multiple genders. It's be great. Lala Tov. Lala Tov. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we did not talk about civics or golems. But I think it's my medieval one. It's like, well, I'm not. Enough that I'm not interested, but like. It's, it's, it could be its own three part series. Oh, yeah. I mean, I th actually, I taught a three part series on demons and angels, and I wish I'd only done demons because they take up so much real estate. And even then, I was like, it was too much. It was because, like, 